In this episode of Mind Pump, we answer fitness questions asked by listeners like you. Now, in the beginning of the episode, we do a lot of fun conversation. We mention a uh, few things about our lives. We talk about current events, talk about studies. Here's what went on in this episode of Mind Pump. We started Here's by talking- what went down. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. Yeah. Here's, we started out by talking about Tim Kennedy's post. He did a whole post on the halftime show of the Super Bowl. Uh, during that period of uh, conversation, my microphone broke, so you get to hear uh, Doug fixing my mic. <laughs> you went all flaccid on us. Good times. Uh, then I talked about Lane Norton and his Biggest Loser post, so we went into that show. Then we talked about Justin's improv class the other night and why he got reprimanded. Yes, and. Always getting in trouble. Then we talked about Tesla. Tesla. If you've been listening to Mind Pump now for a little while, you know how I've been harping on these guys to try and invest in Tesla. Of course, they don't listen to me. And now Tesla just tripled their value. Dang it. Wow. Then we talked about Facebook and their value. We mentioned a new company called Parked, which is kind of interesting. We talked about a special guy's birthday today. That's hmm. kind of cool. You're special, Sal. It's, it's my, you. It's my birthday. Yeah. Then I talked about creatine and how it may actually uh, add years to your life. So you may have heard of creatine. Uh, as it uh, applies to building muscle, burning body fat through the indirect process of speeding up the metabolism. But creatine has some health benefits as well. Now, you may be wondering, where do I get a good source of creatine? One of our favorite companies, Legion, sells a phenomenal creatine product called Recharge, and we have a discount for you, not just for Recharge, but for all of the Legion products. Here's what you do. Go to buylegion.com. That's B U Y. L E G I O N dot com forward slash mind pump and use the code mind pump at checkout for 20% off your total order. Now, if you're already a member of Legion, you'll get double rewards points for using that discount code. So everybody gets hooked up. Then yeah. I talked about red light therapy and how they that may boost ATP production in the cells. Now, ATP is the main source of energy of the body. Having more ATP means you're younger, stronger, burn more body fat. Uh, you can regrow hair through more ATP production. ATP, it's dynamite. No joke. Um, and red light therapy is a great way to do this. Now, our favorite company that makes red light panels that you can use at home is Juve. Juve is high quality. These red light panels are very effective. Don't buy the crappy ones that you get from other companies. They simply don't work. They'll burn you. You want to go with a company that is legit like Juve. Now, of course, we have a hookup for you through, through them as well. Just go to juve.com, that's J-O-O-V-V.com forward slash mind pump, and you'll get a free MAPS Prime program with the purchase of $500 or more, and we hooked you up with free shipping. Then we got into answering the fitness questions. The first question, this person says, hey, look, what are the best exercises to build out the abs? So, yes, you can build the muscles of the abs, and if you do this, they become more visible even at higher body fat percentages. So we talk all about that in that part of the episode. The next question, this person says, hey, what are some cues that can help a client who can't hip hinge? Hip hinging is when you bend at the hips. It's an important movement for deadlifts, rows, and other exercises where you're bending over uh, towards the floor. So we talk about the techniques around that. The next question, this person says, hey, should I lift heavy while I'm cutting, while my calories are low? Does that make any sense? We think... It does make sense, and we explain why in that part of the episode. And the final question, this person wants to know what we think about different types of shoes for lifting. So you have squat shoes with elevated heels, arch support, flat shoes. You have the five-finger toe shoes. If you work out like Justin, yeah. use stilettos. Uh, so we talk all about the value of the footwear that you wear, what it does for your lifts, and what it doesn't do. Also, we know we did talk about ab training in this episode, which made us think about something. Uh, we want to hook you guys up. We have a program specifically for ab training, specifically to help you build the muscles of your abs. It's called the No BS Six Pack Formula. It is literally a workout designed to help people get a six pack. We're going to give it to you for fifty percent off for the next seventy-two hours. This is a flash sale as of the dropping of this episode, so the sale will end. February 9th, it's 50% off. Here's how you get that program. Go to no BS six pack. So it's N O B S, the number six, P A C K dot com, and use the code ABS50. That's A B S five zero, no space for the discount. Also, all month long, 
Maps Split is 50% off. To get that discount, go to mapssplit.com, M A P S S P L I T.com, and use the code SPLIT50, S P L I T 50, no space for that discount. No bullshit. We should always be hot to try. Dead ant. Dead ant. I'm going to start. Dead ant. Dead ant. I'm going to start today's podcast with um, Adam's favorite unpopular post on Instagram right now. Hey, it's Adam's favorite unpopular post time. Here we go. Beep, beep, boop, boop, beep, beep, boop, See if we had this thing, we could have like a little, you know. Yeah. Doug could do some sound effects for that. We could yeah, make, we we make it a thing. Yeah. No, I'm gonna uh so first one first one up is um Tim Kennedy's post. Oh. Uh, I saw Sal you commented on, on it already, uh and it's highlights the point that that I thought you were making. I thought he's I thought he articulated the point really well. So it's, he's got a picture of Shakira and uh J Lo and you know, they, one of them, she's on the pole spinning around. The other one, she's like spreading her legs out on the ground. Yeah, just classy pictures. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he says, uh, you know, and, and Tim's got, I love Tim Kennedy, by the way. Eventually, we'll have him on the show. I know he's a super busy guy, but I love the stuff that he posts and talks about. And he's like a real world badass. Uh, if you're not following him, good person to follow. As a father of three daughters, yesterday's halftime Super Bowl performance scratched a nerve. The nerve of hypocrisy. I don't want my daughters to be objectified, but I also want them to feel free to be able to do whatever they want, to, inc- to include being sexy. In an era of the Me Too movement, how can we stand by and not take pause at a stripper pole being in a living room of a nearly a- every American household and not consider the consequence? I'm not saying Shakira and Jennifer Lopez did not look beautiful. They did. I'm not saying they don't have the right to dress any way they want. They do. And I'll fight that way. We'll always have the right. I'm not saying that they were not great entertainers, which they are. I'm just questioning the impact that it has on a young woman and men in our country, and yet again, the shifting of our morals. Behavior and actions is what demands respect. If you want to be respected, behave in a way that deserves it. Otherwise, don't try to demand it. I thought that was a a really powerful uh, post and articulated the point that Sal was trying to make uh, on the podcast the other day. I thought that, I mean I I don't have daughters I know you don't have daughters but I know yeah. Sal does so probably. I think yeah I think that's why I was a little bit less sensitive to that it, mainly because it, yeah, I could see that point and I could see where he's coming from with that like completely I totally respect that I just <laughs> for me it's like watching as a as a just a casual uh, onlooker it's what's like, wrong with oh, your, wow they they look good what's wrong with your <laughs> mic <over there? laughs> I tried to, I tried to fix it while listening to you. it broke well first of all That's bend it at the right, elbow dude. bend it at the elbow no 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 it's broke what it's broken look. the whole thing What'd is broke do, yeah, dude. dude it went total limp you went all limp dick on us mm-hmm. dang it's totally, it's totally wow broken. yeah we were we were on a roll there for a second. Yeah, no, it goes, <laughs> that goes, I don't know if this is an omen. You know, I turned forty-one today, and, and my mic went limp. Hey, you know what I'm saying? You know, things just happen. When What's you get it older. feel like to be almost fifty, man? Oh man, it's it's a. Uh, hold on, I want to comment on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, just do it, holding on. Yeah, that we're lip, trying to set you up. That and, limp uh, mic you and all, Yeah, flaccid on us over here. <laughs> What's a, what is up with our our intros lately? We can't get this right. Where we just like that's yeah. You know, in a perfect in a, you know perfect world, maybe we need to hire somebody who has everything all set up before any of us walk in the studio, so we don't have yeah. to worry about bands have that. You know that right. right? Yeah, they got roadies. How much fucking bigger do we need to get? We need a roadie. Yeah, uh, really. Five minutes. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've always wanted smoke machines. Five minutes. We've been here for fucking two hours. Colored lights. You know what I'm saying? Sorry. You know what I mean? Been here for fucking. Hey, is your dick in? A, yeah. Why don't you just switch yeah, mics you right to, here? You have to switch out. The oh arm. my god. Gonna do that. You know what? You know we'll what? Just, we'll we don't even. Start. Nah. We don't even need Sal. Yeah. We need let's Sal. just keep going. <laughs> we need Sal. <laughs> Could you share a study today for us, Justin? Yeah. Yeah, this Justin. Study is on ants. I've been worried about Sal. He's like eating all these ants lately, and. You know, there, there, there's been studies lately that show. Uh, we're going to get to that. I'm going to okay. talk about Tim yeah. Kennedy. Yeah. No, you, can't, you can't drop that. You're going to grow it. mandibles. You we'll, can't leave it. We'll let you when your mic works. We'll let you circle back around to that. Uh, so until now, Justin and I are going to have Oh, a, so I'm just going to stay out? Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, you could talk. You just got to do what you're doing right now. I think you're yeah. fine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's there's nothing wrong with letting people know that shit happens. No, like this it's is fun. This yeah. is this is like how wild we get. Yeah, we're yeah. not gonna let Doug edit this out either. He always likes to edit all this stuff out. This is real life right here. Gotta, oh my god, he just took the entire thing off. Just fuck it, throw it in the trash. Woo! 
New yeah. mic right now. This is how we roll, dude. Oh, man. Don't forget, that thing's going to be super loud because Sal's voice, too. So it's going to be... Yeah, it's ready, set, go. But, uh... Hello? Hello? Yeah. Hey, we're back! Oh! So let's make sure this thing's tight so it doesn't fall. Yeah, get get it tight, Dad. Don't twist anything yeah. too hard. Yeah. You may... Oh, there. You know what it is? Squeeze her down. I know what happened. Huh? What? I know exactly what happened. It's my fault. You guys know how uh, I've been doing all those uh, those forearm trigger sessions oh, in here with the with the stop. gripper. Here, here we go. Hey, man. listen, this is just science. Don't I, I don't understand? You know, it's you can't get. There's upset no with lab science. here. There's no science happening. So what happened is uh, normally I have a, a grip like a like if I was an animal, it would be like a what's that animal that flies down and grabs goats? It's like the the big eagle looking thing uh, in like the a desert. Golden eagle. Yes, yeah, so it's like right, super strong. Yeah, been doing trigger sessions. I went to tighten my mic arm, and I literally stripped. The, the, I stripped the, <laughs> the bolt. I broke it. Something that's supposed to be impossible, I actually did on accident. Anyway, I'm back. Here we are. Wow. So, what did you think? You're so powerful. What did you think of the, uh, Tim Kennedy's post? I, uh, I, well, okay. So, my comment was this: Anytime we see something in media, anytime we see a product uh, or products or category products that we don't like. Anytime we see stores that were just like, why does this exist? This is terrible. We have to take a look in the mirror um, because it's really just a reflection of the consumer. So J-Lo and right. Shakira going on stage. Do you believe that with media? I don't know if I fully. Totally. I don't agree with that. I think so, 100%. I think this, if they weren't getting attention and yeah. money for that, they the would stop. Clicks? They would stop. If, if Shakira and, and J-Lo... It, it did that, and everybody was like, "This sucks." Yeah, I'm but, not going to watch but, this. But I mean, have they never done that though? They've done it their whole career. Oh my god! Remember Cher in 1989 yeah. walking out in like what looked like a reverse g-string? And well, was, that's basically what like Jennifer Lopez was wearing. It was like almost like an homage that it looked like it looked like the same outfit. It did. It's just a reflection on us. That that doesn't mean I like it. Would, would it? Would it? I still am upset about it because what the message is: a woman's value is. Number one values are sex appeal. That's the message mm. my daughter will get. Yeah. If I was a girl, that's what I did. I'm watching it. My daughter's watching the game with us, so we're watching the half the halftime show, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm forced to see it through her eyes because she's yeah. my daughter. So I'm looking at her and her and her cousins with her too, who's a first grader. So my daughter's in fourth grade. Her cousins in first grade. Yeah. Both girls. They're both watching it, just glued to the TV. Could care less about the game. Halftime show comes on. They're watching it, and I'm thinking at that age. At that young of an age, what is the 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 what are they getting from this? And what they're getting from it is, oh, this is what women this is their value. Hmm. It's not the performance. It wasn't the singing. It was the, the you know let's be as sexy as possible all the time. And unfortunately, that's that's what media reflects. You don't see a lot of like you know what you don't see a lot of older wise women being portrayed in in media. Very rare. It's it's older women who look how young she looks and how hot she is. And there's nothing wrong with that. I don't want to. I don't want to demonize. Well, sex, yeah, but it, sex it, sells totally. You know, and we're we're mm. always going to tune into a car wreck or accidents. I, I just think that's it's. And you have to you have to understand too that I don't know, dude. Holly, Hollywood is going to project uh, their message or what they want, regardless of the consumer. Yeah, you know well, what I'm saying they're going to sometimes they're going to they're going to portray or put out the information, whatever information they want to put out, regardless if you're you're not, we're not buying. No one was buying anything. Watching the the Super Bowl. Well, they're buy, they're definitely buying attention and views. Mm. And, sure, and, and and they will look. Hollywood one hundred percent will change their message if they don't make any money. They have nothing. They would have nothing to drive their message with if people didn't buy tickets and pay for that shit. And so it's us. It's mm. it's we're the ones. I'm not, I'm not saying specifically us in this room. But it's the consumer. Sure, us too. It. I mean, pornography is like the number one visited website in in the world. All the websites, hundred yeah, percent. Right. I mean, 100%. And, and so sex sells. Mm -hmm. It sells attention, and regardless of the message it's sending or not, at the end of the day, it'll get the most eyes um, than anything else. So that's a that's a that's a tough one to tackle, right? Yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting to me because I do see this pop up mainly with the Super Bowl because I think it is like. Everybody's watching it. Yeah. You know, at that point, well, it's, it's a like, family event. It's a family thing. Yeah. yeah. So that I think that's where like a bit I, I can understand a bit of the outrage in terms of like, uh, you, you know, that being sort of like forced inside everybody else's families and like, uh, I don't really know how they handle that though. They're entertainers at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, you know, again, I had the remote control in my hand, right. and all I had to do was click it and turn it off. 
Right. You know, so all I'm trying to say is that, you know, we need to accept a little bit of responsibility. Doesn't mean we can't disagree and whatever. I, I, I'm making an observation. And I think it's a true observation. I really do. I think one thing that it, there's a couple things that we, we, we tend to value. We value youth way more than we value age. Um, and you see an older culture, sometimes that's different. Like you see the way that older people are treated in like Japan, for example. Japanese culture places a very high value on people who are older because they're, they're wise. They have smart things to say. Oh, yeah. Our culture tends to make old people look stupid. They have nothing good to say. They're, you know, aging sucks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I'm not just saying this because I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized the irony. But I was, yeah. <laughs> wait a minute. No, you see this too. But Even it's true. In, in, in the tech uh, culture and community, you see a lot of these, uh, you know, executives and, and people in places of power, they're trying to look as young as possible. Yeah. Like the, there's this weird like ageism thing going around where it's like everybody has to be young and, you know, with it and like on the coolest new tech thing and, so it's like it's a lot of pressure now that, yeah. that's interesting. One thing I remember, you know, uh, managing gyms, there were a, a, a few phenomenal examples of uh, people who were older, um, who were aging uh, gracefully and very healthy. There was this one woman that worked out. She was in her uh, mid to late 60s. She had gray hair, so full on gray hair in a ponytail, muscular and strong because she'd been lifting weights for decades, working out wrinkles you know she you, you could tell she never did anything to her face but she looked very very healthy and vibrant then there were men there was that one guy i always tell the story about who was in his 70s who had his 40 year old girlfriend with him and the dude just lifted weights all the time and you know same thing he's just he's vibrant you know there's there's nothing wrong with being healthy and all that stuff i just think that we place so much value on certain things Maybe yeah, you know, maybe maybe not a good thing. So as I'm watching it, because I have my daughter sitting west next to me, if she wasn't there, I'm sure I would have just watched the show. But because she's there, I'm <laughs> of watching. Course. It. Yeah, no, now it's I'm totally looking, different. Yeah, I'm looking at it through her eyes. I'm like, oh shit, you know. Yeah, I, that wouldn't even have, that thought wouldn't even cross my mind until like yeah, you guys brought that up. I yeah, was like, but oh, I, yeah, I could see that. But there's, you know, there's the other side of it too, which is you know, you don't want to shame. You know, yeah. you want people to be sexy. They could do what they want. I well, especially that. the stripper pole always has been that sort of identified thing, right? Like as a as a dad, you're like you know, keep, like the whole Chris keep Rock your bit, the, keep your kid off the pole. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now all of a sudden it's in your living room. You're like, your no. number one thing as a as a father is what to keep your daughter yeah, yeah, off, keep off the stripper pole. pole. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you failed. All right, so along the lines of another unpopular post i thought uh this was i saw um someone shared this with me lane norton yesterday uh it was yesterday the day before uh did a post on a story uh, on his q a when people asked him questions about how do you feel about steve cook on the biggest loser now a little context for you guys steve cook is the 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 handsome guy yeah the handsome trainer that's on biggest loser right now he's uh, first known as an influencer he's tied to jim shark um, and a little backstory also on Steve Cook and Lane's relationship. Lane has coached Steve, I think, a couple times. So they have our friendship and a relationship already. So uh, I thought this would be really interesting to uh, read how Lane would navigate around a question like this. He's got a, he's a friend of, of Steve Cook's, and I also know that Lane's a very intelligent, smart guy and knows as well as we know that uh, what the biggest loser does to get people in shape is horrible and mm. uh, sets entertainment. Yeah, sets people up for fail long term failure. And uh, although it's wrapped in this pretty like emotional positive uh, bow, it's a uh, it's garbage as far as. So I was really interested on how Lane would would uh, address this. And he says, "I like Steve. I've coached him several times. I wish him the best, and I'm sure he will do a great job on the show." I was very uh, turned off by the Biggest Loser. They reached out to me about being on the show. And I even had an interview with one of the casting people. During the interview, I felt very pressured to agree with them that someone could lose 100 pounds in 12 weeks in a healthy way. I refused to agree with them on that and never got a call back after that. They also did not seem to understand the difference between a PhD scientist and a personal trainer, which is disturbing. It would have been huge for my career to get on this show, but at the end of the day, I know I didn't compromise my ethics to do it. But maybe they just picked Steve because he's way better looking than me. Um, and I think this is the this is the the when we talked originally before the show even aired this new season, you know, would we even do it? And you know, we kind of had this little fun debate back and forth. Yeah, like, the, could we do it with integrity? Right. With the right and I think it's an example of you couldn't. I yeah, think yeah. that there is a, a message they are going to present. They are going to deliver that. And if you can't get, if they can't get you to agree or mm -hmm. buy into how they're going to present this. 
uh, then you won't get on the show. So that's my exact point why I don't believe we could have ever done it because you wouldn't have been able to present your message of what you're trying, what you were trying to convey to the, to those clients. And it is, it's, it's to me, it's, uh, it, it may be one of the biggest sellout moves that you can make as a personal trainer. And what a tempting one, because you know, you're going to explode afterwards. Now, the other thing besides you either one, the way I look at it is either one, you sell out or two, you're still young enough in the industry that you're naive to. You just don't know any better. You don't know any better. Yeah. You right. think, okay, we're going to get people lose weight. We're going to inspire them. We're going to train them. Right. And this is how I normally train people or there's nothing wrong with this. It's a good thing. It's healthy. Um, so I get that. It's, it's a, uh, I think if you're getting uh, put on that show, um, you, you know that you're getting picked because you're the marketable, most, uh, marketable, entertaining, <clears throat> even the contestants. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. if you look at the contestants' backstory, of course that plays oh, a role. Yeah. There's a lot of, I'm sure they had they a They vetted, yeah, I'm sure, yeah. like thousands of people to be on the show. And whoever had the best backstory, I mean, made it. They, they're really compelling backstories. Yeah. I don't, you know, I, I've been th I've been thinking a lot about The Biggest Loser uh, because, you know, we watched the, the season premiere or whatever. And, I, you know, I don't have as big of a problem with it as I did before as long as people realize that it's, it's it's good entertainment, and they don't take it for this is good fitness information or this is the way things should now be Now, that's done. interesting you say that after we just followed up this the last conversation that we just had because if the kids could just understand what the real message is and yeah. it's but then they but that's the problem yeah. Yeah. the problem is that the average person watches that show yeah. sure. mainstream america does not view it that way right they don't they and they don't think of it like that right. they that's get true. they get sucked into the emotional part they get motivated to get to the gym they get and they get inspired to do what they see on tv and they think that's the right approach and it's absolutely wrong completely and so that's where I don't agree with you on that one because it, how's it any different than the? Well, no, it's not. It's not any different. It's but again, it's the it's the consumer. It's because if you put a show on, God, mm -hmm. you know what I would love? I would love to see a Biggest Loser where you do everything right, but they do it in a way that also makes it compelling, and entertaining. Because the only way you're going to beat win this battle, the only way you're going to win this, you know, this information uh, war that we have here in fitness and health. Is, is by, yes, you have the right information. That's great. Nice job. You're not going to win the war unless you can capture people's attention and, and, and get them to want to pay attention to you. Otherwise, you'll lose. Yeah. So there's got to be a way. I mean, we try to do this on the podcast all the time. Yeah, we try. There's got to be a way. Otherwise, we'll lose. We'll never yeah. win the battle. Because well, what this they have is drama because of the, the stakes are so, like, they raise the stakes on, on both ends of the spectrum, you know? Yeah. Cause, and it's like that, that's what creates the, uh, the interest there, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, they don't want to see rational, reasonable, like, long term approaches. It's just, it just isn't as competitive. Well, yeah, yeah, the right way is boring. The right way is long. You know, it's long, it's slow, and so it doesn't make very good for a twelve-episode show. Yeah. You, know, you would, if you were to do it, like do you it said, like over a ten-year span. Well, you'd have to, yeah. you'd have, <laughs> and then you just get the highlights. You would definitely have to stretch it at least over a year or two. I, I would do a hundred pounds. You could do in a year. You could do in about a year if you were really aggressively. Though, if you were really doing, but I mean, you could do it. The right way, but aggressively the right way. Right. You know, it would take about a year, maybe a year and a half. Right, right. right. You could spend the first three to four months just building their metabolism up, building strength, strength yeah. good mechanics, and working on that, ramping that up to then start to scale their volume and increase intensity yeah. over the course of the past. Yeah, I'd say so, a year, year and a half, maybe. Yeah, I would like say, yeah, 100 pounds is a lot, you know. So, right. Some of these people are more. So uh, at least a year minimum. I would say more like a year and a half to two years. But I guess if you, if you did, now here's the thing, it would cost so much. It would cost so much. To produce yeah, what, that much content, I didn't even think of that. yeah, then to, <laughs> then to short. Yeah. That's why we, you can't win. It's it's a yeah. it, it, you wouldn't be able to do it unless you're somebody who maybe one day maybe maybe when Mind Pump is so successful we have fuck you money and we can just throw it at projects yeah. that we believe in and it doesn't matter it's not going to be profitable yeah. and we could just do that say hey let's invest a million dollars biggest winner yeah, yeah. yeah right and yeah. do something like that but until somebody feels compelled enough to just lose money on a project. Yeah. Uh, I don't see how you yeah. would you could fight really, fire with fire. With it's this really one. no different than any other entertainment on TV. Like uh, you watch, you know, Grey's Anatomy, or you watch a show on war or law, and you see lawyers arguing in the courtroom. And I'm sure lawyers watching that are like, "Yeah, it doesn't get. It's yeah. not how it works." And whatever. I'm, I'm sure. But the difference is this: the difference is 
those shows typically don't motivate people to go copy them. Mm -hmm. So I'm not watching like a fake war movie and thinking like, oh, I'm going to go be Rambo. You know, I think a lot of people realize like, yeah, if you go, it's not, it's not like that. That's not real. But I think people watch The Biggest Loser and say, this is real. Oh, this is how you can do this. Remember, this is the right way to do I it. mean, we were all in gyms yeah. when the first one premiered. Mm -hmm. When the very first season came out, we were all working in gyms. And I, oh, they the, partnered with 24, didn't they? I remember seeing posters and everything. They did. Now they're with Planet Fitness right now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's uh, you, you, I saw the flood of people that came in afterwards. And that would be one of the things that people would want because they just saw the show. They got inspired by the show. They came, and here's the thing this is what, the, what, how they will defend this. And people that are supporting it will defend it. Well, how could you be upset? It inspired those people to get off the couch and come in and to exercise and work out. And they weren't doing anything at all. Right. So I get that. Like, I, I understand that point. And that makes a lot of sense, especially if you're viewing it from their perspective. Mm -hmm. But if you view it from my perspective, the people that were running the gyms, that were helping those people out, what you what you know ends up happening is you end up setting those people for long-term failure and frustration, and you actually make it difficult, more difficult for That's them. That's the, the point. The point is, yeah. yes, it might inspire some people to get started, but are they better or worse off yeah. uh, afterwards? Did they create even worse habits now? Y yeah, so you end up with worse off. Uh, my, I hope that what happens is people get inspired to then look for better, more accurate information. That's what I hope. I hope people watch it and go, you know what? Yeah. This is motivating me. I'm getting feeling emotional about this. I'm feeling inspired. Let me seek out some good information on how I can do this uh, for myself. And then they educate themselves and then go do it. I hope what doesn't happen is they watch this and are like, fuck yeah, I'm going to lose 100 pounds in three months and I'm going to go work out all day, every day and starve myself and make myself puke after every workout because that's what I see yeah. you know, in the in the show. That's what I hope doesn't happen. You know what's funny, like thinking about that, our generation, I wonder if like Rocky had that kind of impact in terms of like, you know, everybody <laughs> could, trying to join a boxing gym and drinking, you know, raw eggs and all that. I, I definitely did the raw eggs part and the jump rope. That was something I got inspired. You learn. I think you learn really fast <laughs> that boxing's not for everybody. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh, I don't like it in the yeah. face. Dang! As soon as you get punched once, you're yeah. like, oh, I'm a cool. Hey, yeah. Rocky wasn't. You can real. have that rock. Yeah, yeah. I'm cool. Yeah. Hey, anyway. how's uh, how's your uh, improv going right now? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. it's been going good. Uh, the last two weeks, so it's been ramping up because I guess it's like in the middle of the, it's like an eight week uh, class or whatever, and so. You know, we got sort of like put on the hot seat uh, last week, and that was like something I was like, "Oh wow, it's it's sort of turning up another notch." Where like he gave everybody, uh, you know, a time to get in front of the entire class, and then he's like, "Okay, now you're going to do a TED talk," and I'm just like. I'm going to do a TED talk. I'm like, Oh shit. <laughs> like, I was not prepared for this, you oh, know? Wow. And so I was like, well, I'm a fitness guy. Yeah. Like I, I know at least a couple subjects I can like at least teach the class and like be <laughs> Fili confident. Filibuster on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just bullshit <laughs> my way through it like normal. Right. And, uh, and then like, as you get to go up there, there was a wrinkle to it. It's like, Oh yeah. And by the way, I'm going to give you the subject. Oh, and you're not going to know what the hell it is until you get up there. And meanwhile, this whole time, everybody's going up and I'm like second to last, you know? And so I'm like sweating my way through everybody. Get Everybody was visibly nervous too. It wasn't like it was, um, you know, everybody, yeah, it's my time to shine. You know, it was what like a fun exercise. We're yeah. so nervous, dude. And you could tell, but it was great though. I mean, everybody in the class did really well. So what did uh, you get? What'd you get? Oh, I got some stupid. It was like a uh, yellow roses, like, and I had to like go off about like yellow roses and in uh, you know why the significance of them and now are you allowed what, to, what they smell like? You can like. make up whatever you, you want. Just, you can I, lie. I, I completely went like left field with it and started like talking about whatever aliens and you know I, I went I went <laughs> off like I was just going completely random like it's all stream of consciousness. So that's kind of what they're trying to teach you in the classes to just go. You know, right, like right. don't 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 use your logical brain anymore and just just go. So anyway, that was like it, it was like a milestone for me. I was like, oh my god, this is great because it's like, you know, that that used to be my childhood fear forever was to get up there and not know where I was going to go with right. whatever I was going to talk about in front of a, a group of people. Oh yeah, and so it just brought back all that that stuff. You know, like I had all those same feelings as a kid uh, immediately, and then I got up there and did it, and then it was like, ah. Oh, Oh shit! Yeah, all right, I got this, you know. And so it was great. Uh, and then this week, uh, we're, we're going through kind of like 
like narrative. And so we're, we're trying to get through stories and like how to like kind of build off everybody's stories. And so we're going around this group and there's like 20 people and you start out and you give like a sentence of like, you know, the, the theme was like horror. And so you, everybody's kind of building this story all the way down the line. And uh, so I'm like, again, I'm like towards the end for some reason. And so everybody's kind of building up on the person in front of them story, this, you know, thing in front. And then every now and then you get somebody kind of interrupting it with some weird, like, like left turn, yeah, you know? And so it's, it keeps going and it gets a little bit weirder. And I'm literally like losing track of like where the hell this story is going. And then this girl's like says, uh, you, you know, like her addition to it. And then it comes to me and I'm like, Oh my God, I have nowhere to go with this. And I'm just like, and then Pauly Shore jumps out with a chainsaw. You know, <laughs> everybody's just up. like, like, it, like, and I got a laugh and all that stuff, but it was like, you know, how I am kind of on the podcast. It's like, I just have this like Tourette's of like, ah, I don't know, left field curveball. Here you go. Yeah. And, uh, and so then like it, he didn't like, and the teacher didn't like mean to, but he was totally making an example about this because the class is kind of gearing you to be a team. And how to like kind of perform on stage to build off each other, use each other, and you just set somebody up. up. I fucked the person behind me, right? Like right after me. Like they didn't really, it was hard for them to kind of piece it back together and like keep the story going. Yeah. And so I was like, oh shit. You, you back fucked. Yeah. Mm. Back so what, what did, did he say? Trouble? Did you get into it with him or did he say something to you? He no, no, no. You? No, he didn't. No. And the thing was, he wasn't even trying to like, he was, he was trying to make it like, for everybody, but it was totally like, like I was sitting there like, oh, she's talking about me. This is like, an example when somebody yeah. fucks up to what we're trying to do. Oh, somebody's got star syndrome over here. You know, <laughs> he didn't say. Oh, that. he wants all the laughs. You know, and I was like, ah, oh, shit. You He's know? like, this is improv. Nothing is wrong here. However, however, what you just did wrong. is like horrible. that was the, oh, that was the wrongest thing you could do. I'm like fuck, dude, <laughs> in this class. But but that's what I'm interested in. So I'm like, I don't know. Like I, I get, I've been getting a lot out of the class, and I love you know, what I've been learning, but honestly, I'm more interested in the comedy aspect of it than I am the, uh, dramatic, like building a scene. Like I'm not yeah. into the acting shit. Really? Yeah. Well, the I feel like you're such a natural actor though. Yeah. I do. Really? Yes, absolutely. And I can already see, I can see since you've been taking the classes, I can see a difference in how you talk and tell stories and stuff. I think it's really oh, good. Thanks. Yeah. No, the, the storytelling part like that has helped tremendously. Like, I do feel it's what I need. Yeah, I know? feel like you use uh, better hand gestures. What? I do a lot of, <laughs> yeah, he's better with his hands now. What was he doing before? <laughs> before when he was talking, he was doing ramp water shit. You know what I'm saying? It was his just hands off. were going all over. Yeah, the place. it's like <laughs> those double dribbling. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, he's like saying yes. You know, doing things. Like, yeah, they're like, what? What's going like, on? These don't with, match. What are you doing What's here? Happening? Yeah. Now he's like on point. Too yeah. many wires were crossing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I've been hanging out with Italians. I, I you know, the, those are those are really cool exercises, though. Oh I'm, yeah, dude, we would benefit tremendously from doing it. I would love to do this stuff with you guys. I feel like we need to bring somebody in, and then we just need to. Power this out between the well, three anybody, of us. Well, anybody who's in a, in a situation that you're on a, a speaking all the time in any platform, whether it be in person or on a podcast. Yeah, but it's also the exercises. They're designed to make... I've trained clients that were big into this, and they would talk about it constantly, and um, it makes a lot of sense. Dude, all I highly recommend it, for yeah, sure. I feel like it's a... And it's, you know, it's one of the skills, one of the most valuable skills anybody can learn, in my opinion, besides your ability to sell your ideas because that's also very valuable is public speaking or presenting in front of people because so many, and it's only valuable because so many people are afraid of it. Yeah. So like, if I don't care what field you're in, if you're good at that, you're probably going to do well because everybody else is terrified mm -hmm. to present. And well, talk this to is, the, I actually used totally. to teach sales this way. So I am first, I, I taught myself that when I was trying to learn uh, you know, how to sell a package of training and like, how do I recommend certain, and that was, that's nerve wracking for a trainer when you first get in, like most train, you get in to help people train the body. You love kinesiology. All of a sudden, then all of a sudden you find out, holy shit, 80% of this job is selling. And mm -hmm. I didn't know I was signing up for this. Lucky for me, I have that in my blood and I'm passionate about that. Uh, trying to get better at it. And so one of the things I used to love to do is I would walk up to one of my peers and I would just start rifting. Like, off the cuff, like make make up 
who they are and their goal yeah. and try and get them to engage with me and just totally make up yeah. a whole story. And it was a great way to practice. Now, they all thought it was kind of funny at first. And then, of course, after they noticed I would do it all the time to them, they would try and get hard. They'd throw harder and harder angles at me and go left, then right. And then I try to work my way around the conversation, still circle them back to whatever I'm recommending and try and make sense of it. Now, none of it was real. And I wasn't using real things like real body fat percentage numbers and real science to support what I was selling. I was really just getting in the the practicing the art of communication and the ability to, you know, build off of a story like that or co- keep going and play with someone like that. Man, when I tell you doing that exercise and and practicing that, and then you get into a real world situation and it happens to be your profession and what you then that stuff is easy. Totally. Oh, yeah. It makes that total re- carryover. Oh, totally, for sure. Totally, totally. The biggest fear that he, one of the biggest fears that humans have is to be socially rejected. It's a massive, massive fear. In fact, yeah. social isolation is considered a cruel and unusual punishment uh, by the Geneva Convention. So when you ask people, because they do this, what are your number, what are your top 10 fears? Public speaking is number one. Public speaking is almost always in the top three and usually. It's number, number one. I think it's number one yeah. uh, nationwide. They've done studies oh, on that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. oh, yeah. So yeah. if you can get good at it, you're like, uh, you know, you have a skill that everybody's afraid of. Oh, boy, the value. It's my kid's school, or, or I should say my daughter's school because my son goes somewhere else now. They do a lot of this where they mm-hmm. have to go up and talk in front of the whole school. So smart. And yeah, I look at it and I, I realize like this is important. Like mm-hmm. as much as the kids hate it, yeah. it you got to practice this. Well, because- I mean, an example we, we mentioned earlier, I brought up Steve Cook and, and Lane Norton stuff. And Steve Cook's an example of someone like this is an example where he's got a, a little bit of information fitness. He's good looking. And most importantly, he can communicate really well yep. on, on this social platform. I think a lot of people that are just tuning in or paying attention, they don't realize like how good that person is at that that, that craft. And we've, we've obviously uh, felt, I mean, the first time we had to uh, turn on uh, the cameras for like YouTube, God, I hated that. Mm-hmm. It's awful, you know, and we, we make fun of it and show the bloopers and things like that, but it's not easy. Mm-hmm. No. And what's not easy about it, it's not, I'm totally not nervous to explain fitness. I've been doing that my entire life. It's just nerve wracking. It's new. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it's uncomfortable. And the people that tend to excel in those spaces, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, these platforms are people that are very comfortable talking to themselves like now, that. Now, do you think, <laughs> you, know? Totally. you know what, you just made me think of something. I wonder if kids today, because they're so used to FaceTime, seeing their own faces as they're talking to their friends, more comfortable posting the on social media, mm-hmm. posting their thoughts on their Instagram page I or TikTok. Right. I wonder if they're going to be, of, if it's going to be more second nature. Of course it is. And we have examples of that. Um, I won't roll people under the bus, but people that we would consider friends or fans of the show and we've known for a long time that are massive influencers that have millions of people following them. You know, we meet the first time we all met them in person, they were so different. Mm -hmm. They have this incredible, loud, outgoing personality on YouTube or Instagram, but in real life, their social skills are are awkward. They look look down at the ground. You're right. They're more comfortable with inanimate objects than they are just like communicating with people. What a flip. Yeah. Yeah. What a reversal. Yeah. That's true. No, it's very, it's very. Inanimate objects for me has always been a big barrier. I remember talking to uh, one of our early on uh, interns and he was telling me about how uncomfortable guys are talking to girls face to face, but texting is like, yeah, or or even uncomfortable talk on the phone, yeah, like to hear each other's voice. Like, I don't know what to say. Like, what do you mean you don't know what to say? You text each other all day long, right? Yeah. You know, right. that's true. No, that's it's, weird. Yeah, that's that's really what weird. a trip. You hey. know, you know what else is weird is uh, Sal's prediction on Tesla. Yeah, that's that was right. pre- pretty weird. Yeah, <laughs> it's not weird. We could have made a lot of money, boys. <laughs> Gosh damn it. I wasn't it. stopping you. I mean, at that, from... at that stock price, what are you going to buy? 10 yeah, at no, best? Exactly. Dude, they. They're... I mean, you would have doubled, almost tripled your I'm gonna money. I'm going to look by at now. it right. Wow. Oh, okay, no, so. It's, it's almost 3X, right? I, I brought it up. The uh, first time I think I brought it up to you guys was back in October or somewhere around there, November. It was around $300. Yeah. You know what it's at right now? Right this second? Hmm. 922 bucks. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Exploding. <laughs> His stock, that company's stock gets traded like a exciting tech stock. It does not get traded like a car company right? because the numbers don't reflect that value. That's insane. 922. You know what I mean? What's so they just reveal like uh, some some massive like numbers for projections for next year? Yeah, their, their sales are doing pretty good and you know he's considered a revolutionary you know in terms of his uh, you know the, 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 his cars. I, he did kind of start a movement with his electric cars. Yeah. Uh, you know we talked about this the other day. The, you know oh, electric yeah, cars were 
were not cool before. He kind of made them cool. Yeah. Uh, he's an icon. I don't think the company would do nearly as well if it wasn't for just him being the face. Mm-hmm. Uh, but nonetheless, fuck, man, we could have made some money, boys. Uh, no, well, I, I knew there was something because uh, I, I go to the grocery store and, and, and get all the groceries and all that. And now half the parking lot is those charging stations. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I'm like, when did this happen? It mm-hmm. just all of a sudden it looks so futuristic now. You know? Oh, they're 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 crazy. I see probably. I mean, we're in the Bay Area too, but I must see at least six or seven Teslas a day. Yeah, at, like it's, uh, yeah, they're everywhere. Yeah, to the it's like here a, anyway. Exactly, it's like a Honda. They're yeah. just driving all over. Well, the place. along the lines of of stocks, cool companies to watch. I have a couple for you guys. One, uh, everybody knows what Facebook is. Facebook has taken a huge dive. You saw the. Stephen King came out and, and uh, talked some shit about them, and I forget what else was going on. That really? Time. Yeah, and of course they've been under, uh, you know, uh, speculation. Well, I know Zuckerberg came out and said he's going to protect uh, privacy and free speech or something like that on Facebook. Yeah. So they're going to try and let people say what they want. To have. I don't know exactly what he means by that, but that's yeah, a little controversial. I mean. Yeah. So I mean, the, the stock has taken a huge dip, uh, which intrigues me uh, because I know what's also in the the forefront for them. Uh, they've been working on this for a while now. They own WhatsApp, right? You know mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. And WhatsApp is about to launch their uh, direct pay, um, what do you call it? Just like PayPal oh, know, yeah. or Venmo. Or yeah, whatever. that'll so be huge. They're going to, yeah. And it's, you know, WhatsApp is one of the most downloaded apps. I think Facebook is almost, I think they're a, a buy. I mean, they mm-hmm. went from two, they were at 220 was their share price. It dropped all the way down to 204. It seems like it's on its way back up. I like Facebook because people need to. Uh, pe- what people need to realize is they are. If they were a country, they'd be one of the largest countries in the world. Oh. They know more information about their users than anybody Dude, else. This ever. is why I feel like they have the most potential to be evil out of all <laughs> yeah. of them. You oh, know? of course they it's do. It's like they got all the dirt, yeah. and people just willingly give it to them. Yeah, yeah. you're right, one hundred percent. They, they know a lot about the people that that are part of their and their advertising. I think is still. Underrated, yeah, and and uh, Facebook advertising. I mean, you can make a killing well, with Facebook advertising. And that's why I thought it was crazy. Everybody put all that money into the Super Bowl commercials, put that into like Facebook advertising. They probably would have triple, quadrupled their their numbers just doing that. Yeah, uh, uh, no, one hundred percent would be a better investment. Again, I think we, that goes back to what we kind of said before. It's more of a brand play, right? Yeah. Just brand awareness. You, you're going to get what it, what you won't get is the mm-hmm. amount of eyes that are viewing that's as true. much as the Super Bowl, right? You're getting millions and millions of eyes all at once. Mm. Um. Uh, another cool company. Check this one out, dude. Um, I wanted to wait till the podcast to even share this one with you guys to get your reaction. How uh, what a good idea this is. Company getting started right now. Startup called Part P A R K apostrophe D. This uh, what they are is the Uber of parking spaces. So imagine in this city. Imagine by a uh, football oh, I stadium. On this. I already know. I, I football can't, stadium. This was, is amazing. You, I always wanted to buy a parking lot. Bro, for this reason. how fucking brilliant is this? So if you, you live nearby, you have your own parking you, spot. I mean, you could do this anywhere. You could do it at your house if you want. But yeah, you makes, could rent out your parking. Yes. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, that is really smart. Ima- wow, that's brilliant. Imagine, like, especially places like San Francisco, right, where it's parking is horrendous, yeah. and you get charged. You know, if you park in uh, San Francisco for the day, you're spending 20 to fifty dollars. You can't on. park without like fifty dollars is everywhere. Right. So That's imagine you are yeah you someone's have, little driveway. Yeah, that has, fits two cars. And you go on the app and you connect it. Is yeah. that what it is? And you, yes. And oh, you that's and brilliant. you and they automatically pay you just like through Uber that it links to them. They pull in they pull you can and imagine you could set it up. So you work all day long. You say you're in San Francisco. Yeah, like you're not home. You're not home. Wow. So you set it for the hours that you're at work all day. You know, you make 25 to 50 that's bucks. So smart. That is so smart. Is now, it brilliant yeah, or what? Yeah. Now, I think it's I think that's a phenomenal business idea. You here's why Uber's I don't going to buy them. Here's why I don't like it long term. I'll mm. tell you why. Long term, I think parking spaces are going to be obsolete. I really do. Oh, for the automated. Yeah, I think you're not going to mm. need to worry about God, parking. God, that's, that's, that's a that's a long, a long that's yeah. a long ways away before we don't have 20 years. I would yeah, say yeah, probably yeah, about that's fair. Yeah. yeah, if you were to say ten, I would challenge that. But yeah. twenty is probably yeah. Twenty is probably. I was gonna say we got a we got a long ways before it's all. I mean, just we, the regulation. We haven't alone. even seen uh, horses and cars on the roads together for a long enough period of time. We're gonna see that for at least a decade. So we're gonna see self driving cars and regular cars on the road, just like they saw that transition for a while before you see it eliminated. Yeah, yeah. To we, we have at least 15 to 20 years. But, yeah. But damn, so, what a great idea. Right? Isn't that, that is so brilliant. I knew you guys would like that. Hey, I saw hey, I saw that. I'm though. angry I didn't come up with that. Hey, do you guys want uh, another reason to take creatine? I know, oh. we, I don't, I know <laughs> we don't need more reasons, but uh, a, a study came out that shows that 
there might be more reasons to take creatine that have nothing to do with building muscle and getting stronger. Why Why do you think this is happening? And Crazy. I feel like it's been happening more, uh, more often than not is we're starting to see more and more research around creatine for all the other benefits. Like, was it only studied for like, you know, the ergogenic benefits from it or was it initially? Some yes. Uh, but because remember ATP is the, is one of the main sources of energy of your mitochondria in all your cells. ATP is a fundamental source of energy. Creatine turns into ATP. When you take creatine, you have more ATP to fuel all your cells, not just your muscle cells, but your brain, your mm. organs. Studies are showing there's antioxidant benefits. There's cognitive benefits. Studies have shown that uh, athletes who take creatine are less likely to suffer from brain injury, like uh, like CTE or oh, wow. concussions. But a new study came out that showed that. So when you work out, one of the things that happens when you lift weights, one of the benefits of lifting weights is you actually increase the amount of mitochondria in your muscles. Mm. So your your mitochondria is like the energy powerhouse of your cells. Mm -hmm. When you're lifting weights, one of the adaptations besides building muscles, you get more mitochondria. Your body's like, okay, we need more of these energy uh, producers in the in these in these uh, parts of the body because we're trying to get stronger and, and we're adapting. And that's a very good thing. Lots of mitochondria, healthy mitochondria makes you youthful. It gives you more energy, more strength. It's better for your brain if, you, if there's more there. There's better for your heart, all that stuff, right? So studies show exercise does that. Exercise plus creatine dramatically amplified this effect in a recent animal study. They showed that the mitochondria that normally increased from, from exercise was far greater when creatine was introduced. Here's the other thing. They, they saw increased mitochondria in the heart as well. Oh, so not only were the muscles becoming better and stronger, hmm. but they found this in the heart. Other, sto other, other studies are showing that it may happen to uh, organs like your liver, your lungs, wow. and et cetera, which may be it one of the- sense. This is one of the keys to living a, a more youthful, in terms of your health, life. Mitochondrial health mm -hmm. is, when you look at all the studies on aging- uh, they they focus heavily on on the mitochondria right. because that is a big. If the mitochondria stays healthy, you're less likely to have cancer, less likely to have a heart attack, far less likely to have anything that's age related. Isn't this similar to what uh, red light therapy is supposed to do too? Okay, so here's the here's the hack. First off, supplement with creatine unless you're intolerant to it. Um, it's creatine's probably a good supplement for for most people to take. You don't need a ton of it. If you eat a lot of red meat, you need very little, one to two, maybe three grams a day. Uh, if you're vegan, you probably need more, like five grams a day, because you're not getting it from food. Um, great source of creatine is uh, Legion. Legion makes a good creatine supplement. You want to get a good source because uh, creatine can come from uh, sources that are cheaper, and you're going to get. What was that latest post? Uh, with Paige Hathaway's uh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what anyway, go research it. that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was that was interesting. You want creatine monohydrate? That is the studied form of creatine. All these other versions of creatine are no better and, and oftentimes are worse. When they finally do do studies on these other forms, they find, oh, that one creates bad byproducts. This one doesn't mm -hmm. work as well. So creatine monohydrate is what you want. Uh, the brand is Legion's the one that we recommend. Here's the second thing you can do. There's lots of things, by the way, you can do to boost mitochondrial health. Have a good diet, exercise. Uh, you know, uh, Going into ketosis occasionally is really good for mitochondrial health, so fasting or doing a ketogenic style diet for certain periods of time. You don't need to do it long term, but just to, again, boost the health of your mitochondria. Uh, red light therapy. Red light therapy is, is one of the ways that it works, or one of the main ways that it works. It, you know, it, For example, it helps people regrow hair, which is crazy to hear, but it's legitimate. Like That's proven in studies. Reduces wrinkles in skin. Uh, physical therapists have used red light therapy to and all this help is related recovery. to the mitochondria, right? That's this the is all for producing more right. ATP for the mitochondria. So the red light penetrates the body mm. and it it turns. It's like a turbo for the mitochondria, producing more ATP, more energy. So creatine. Here's the hack, right? Take some creatine. Wait 30 minutes. Get in front of your red light, uh, you know, therapy. Like if you have a juve light or whatever, stand in front of it. Do your thing. 
and you should get like an amplified effect uh, from both of those. Wow. <laughs> it's a doing. little it's a little supplement plus, you know. That's so cool. I would have never act. considered like organs uh, as a factor in part of that process with creatine. Yeah, creatine has been shown in other studies to just have protective effects on the heart, antioxidant effects yeah. uh, on the heart. It's uh it's a, like again, I think in the next 5 to 10 years, creatine will be the number one general health supplement. Isn't it funny? Because we've watched, you know, we were around for the, the, the introduction of it, right? And mm-hmm. so do you remember, like, when it first came out- it, Well, there was a scare behind it. Well, that was the second part, right? Yeah, so the yeah. first part blew up because it, it worked. It worked. It yeah. worked. All the research people was showing how big, amazing strong. it was. So, of course, and then, of course, there's a lot of people that- try to get attention by countering it and and talking to what and I remember the scares. I remember that part of the reason why I remember stop taking Celtech is some article had came out back then that was saying that there was cases where creatine was building up in people's gut and they had like you know, it was like <laughs> sitting sitting at the bottom of your stomach, and it was just like it was not. No, the, the, the bad thing of Celtech was the seventy five grams of pure sugar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. It wasn't, it wasn't but the, I remember that's what scared me away was like the, the the I had this. Well, they thought it was bad for their your kidneys. I think we had a guy too. come in that was was trying to uh, like put out like sort of a PSA for the entire football team because like we were all like, oh wow, did you guys find this creatine? This is amazing, and yeah. and they were trying to like caution us like about you. Using it because they're like, well, we don't know too much. Yeah. Like it's gonna like fuck up now, your kidneys. Now to, to their defense, back then we didn't know a whole lot. Right. And right. the studies, and and we do know that the kidneys filter creatine just like they filter protein. So it was like a, it's a logical conclusion. Like oh, don't take too much. It could overwrite. But the studies, there's literally been there's thousands of them that now have been done on creatine, and all and most of them look at kidney and liver function. And if you're otherwise healthy, there's no, there's no negative effects. Yeah. Now, if you have kidney problems or you have liver issues, you but should. You don't always, want to exaggerate that. Yeah, you should always talk to your doctor and see if it's uh, if if it makes sense. But otherwise, it's it's a totally safe, yeah. uh, cognitive boosting, athletic performance boosting, and now we're finding it's a rejuvenating youth type uh, a supplement. Shit, I now the, get back on the it only <laughs> the only negative I've ever seen on creatine ever is that it may and, and this I can't see how this is a negative. It may increase the amount of androgen receptors that are available for testosterone in men. So it may have a a kind of indirect testosterone boosting effect which I guess some, oh, no. someone might think that's a negative if they have like pr- yeah. a prostate enlargement or something like that. I don't know. But yeah. Sounds wow. like a plus to me if you ask right. me. Yeah, sounds like a plus. First question is from Noah K35. What are the best exercises to build abs out? I've tried hanging leg raises, but I can't get my abs to stick out more. Okay, so building the the muscles of the abs get them bricks. is is the same as you would uh, approach building any muscle in your body. So the best rep ranges to build muscle uh, for all muscles is between one heavy rep all the way up to maybe 20 repetitions. Those are all good muscle building ranges. Now with the abs, I would say you probably wouldn't do very well with really, really low reps because it's so hard to have perfect form. But lower reps are okay. I'm not. I'm, I'm talking about like you don't want to do like a single, like one or two reps. But you can do five, six heavy resistance reps uh, with your abs, abs, and of course you can get up to 20. The key is to use good resistance and here's the other key. Train your abs in a full range of motion. Most people don't do this. They mm-hmm. work their abs, but the abs tend to be stabilizers or tend to be kind of play second fiddle. So using the example of the hanging leg raises, I have yet to see, I've probably seen in my entire career working in gyms, five people do a hanging leg raise properly. Yeah. Most people just bend, they, they, they bend at the hips, the legs come up or the knees come up, and the abs are stabilizing. But the, the muscles that are doing the movement, full range, are the hip flexors. The ab function is to bring the pelvis closer to the rib cage or the rib cage closer to the pelvis. So it's literally curling your low back or curling your hips up. So when you do a leg raise, it's not just lifting the legs. It's yeah. curl. It's it's tip. It's it's curling the the hips. I hate it's having this. The I hate having this conversation on the podcast. Mm, the I know. abs are visual. One, no, it is. The abs are one of the hardest things to try and uh, articulate on this show. Like mm-hmm. it's it's something that visually I have to have something to be able to show a client or actually move their body to get them to understand because it's arguably the probably one of the 
I don't know, most uh, most commonly done wrong exercise. Yeah, miss, uh, uh, practiced. Right, just because even when you have poor form, you look like you're kind of doing it right. And you feel it. Yeah, you and still ex- feel exactly, it. and you still feel it because yeah. the abs are still, they're working in, in that. When If you do a, a, a hip flexor sit-up, right, you use mostly your hip flexors. Abs still work. Mm-hmm. They're still in, they're at least stabilizing at the bare minimum. Maybe you get a little bit of a contraction in it, and, the, and you look like you're doing it right. Mm-hmm. So it's really hard to try and explain to somebody on a podcast like how to do this well, but you know, in my experience, when you have somebody who wants to build their abs, uh, one of the best things to do is that low, heavy rep range, because mostly because nobody does it. Well, the, the novelty of it is the main reason why I think it's the best. But the drawback is that most people already don't know how to connect to the abs very well and do a basic setup with using all of their abs, right. much less, okay... Now I'm going to recommend to these people they should go do yeah, heavy Yeah, that's five. why we caution like just all of a sudden going to loading it and doing like a, a lower rep range if you haven't actually done the work of getting uh, that kind of activation out of your abs. I'm trying to think like I think the the only one I can think of that probably like for me has always made the most sense to load is like a decline sit up. Yeah. Well, 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 here's the thing. Load is all relative. You take somebody who doesn't know how to really work their abs properly you have them do a physio ball crunch, yeah. and they're doing low reps. Or a perfect spit up. Yeah, a spit sit- up, sit up. <laughs> <laughs> a perfect sit up. <laughs> You're in da- dad mode. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> like, that was the dad like, like Jesse's bragging Good about job. his son. He's like, hey, guys, look, I know kids spit <laughs> up. My kid does <laughs> the perfect spit up. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, no it's, uh, uh, it is it is low reps because they, they don't have the strength to do right. more than six or seven. I have yet to have a new person get put on a physio ball, have them do a proper crunch the right way, with full extension, full oh, contraction. Oh, try, try, yeah. try this. And here's the best visual I think I could give that most people hopefully can understand is you know lie completely straight out, flat on your back, and try and sit your your body at your torso up. But as you're trying to think of your spine and the vertebrae and how they look, right? Have everyone seen the skeleton before? Think of the vertebrae, and you're trying to roll up each individual vertebrae yeah. slow and controlled. Imagine try, you're a piece of paper. Do they call up. it the perfect Dude, setup? Yeah, perfect yeah. setup. But try doing five of those. Yeah. yeah. Try the and that's try so, doing one. Right. That <laughs> extreme you're right. You're not even gonna be able to probably do one perfect. So that's a great way of that would be technically low rep heavy loading because you can't even probably Dude. do one or two of those really well. And a way to assist yourself is you take a rubber band Around like a uh, you know you like can the put squat, around your feet even yeah squat rack or yeah even your feet right mm-hmm. and then you use the rubber band to help assist you in that perfect articulation of the spine rolling up man work on that really well and and low reps slow and control and then slowly that's a great video I don't think we've done that we no. did we yeah, did we, we, with we actually, the rubber band assistant I, no, I don't know if I don't I've think done, so I don't know if I've done one with the rubber band assistant but I know we've done we them. have a lot of ab videos we do. Uh, on the YouTube channel so we'll we'll make sure to to attach some of them in the show notes. That, that demonstrate kind of what we're talking about. I went through this. I remember, I mean, I'd been working out for years until I figured this out. And I, rem- I remember I got real lean. I was supposed to go on a, a vacation somewhere. I got really lean and I got my body fat down to like nine or 8%. And you could see my abs when I'd flex them. So you could see like, oh, he's got, you know, flat midsection. He's got nice abs. But when I didn't flex them, they weren't visible. And I was always jealous of the guys that had the abs that just always show. They didn't have to flex. Their abs just stuck out. So I thought, God, do I have to get that much leaner? Do I have to get that much more shredded? And I was reading some you know, muscle magazines, or I think I was reading a, a, an old bodybuilding book. And in there, they were talking about building the abs so that they, they showed more at higher body fat percentages. And I thought, well, that makes perfect sense because I know when I develop my quads or my chest or my back, I don't have to necessarily get leaner it's more visible because there's more muscle. So I right. thought, I'm going to try to build my abs. And so that's exactly what I did. And I always thought I didn't have a great midsection. I always thought that's just one of my weaknesses. So I started training this way. I started to slow my reps down. I focused on all on lumbar extension and flexion. Well, so isn't, this, is, isn't this what inspired you to write uh, the, the No, no B- BS, BS six-pack? Six right. Yep, absolutely. And I did it. And within six months, no joke, I went from, from the guy who had abs that weren't really visible to they built out so much. If I wore a tight T-shirt, you could see them through my T-shirt, and it was all because I built. I actually started getting pumps on my abs. I would work them out and feel a pump in them, like with like you do with your biceps. They're muscles, just like any other muscle in your body. You have to train them in a similar way. That does that means you're not doing a hundred reps. 
You're not just going real fast, jerky motion. You're not doing weird light movements. You are using resistance. That may mean that you're not using uh, external resistance. But what I mean by that is pick hard exercises, do them slow, full extension, full squeeze and contraction. Get the rib cage close to the pelvis. Squeeze that, then extend back. Think of it this way. It's like uh, when you're standing straight up, can you take your pelvis and tuck it and stick your butt out? So every time you tuck your tailbone, that's your abs contracting. Every time you stick your butt out, that's your abs lengthening. That's what the abs do. The abs don't bring the legs up uh, to your chest. Next question is from Nick DeFitness. What are some cues that can help a client who can't hip hinge and keep their back flat? Oh, it's kind of similar, right? Well, mm -hmm. I also gave, uh, so I think this this video is supposed to go up. I think uh, it goes up this week. Uh, I think it was, the I said, the, the, the number one controversial tip for deadlifting in rows, and it's the stick your ass out cue mm -hmm. uh, that a lot of coaches don't like. Um, but personally, I, I have found a lot of value in that cue for the average person to get to understand how to get their their keep their back flat. Because the most common thing when someone bends over to do a row or bends over to do a, a barbell, it's all at the back. Yeah, mm -hmm. they round at the back and they don't slide the hips back. And so the stick your ass out and slide your hips back cue has been the the number one cue of for me to get that across to a client. Now I understand that if you if you have an excessive anterior pelvic tilt and then you ex, and then you stick your ass out any even more, you could be risking some you know you know pinched nerve or shearing in, uh -huh. in the low back. Uh, but so it's very as a coach the the answer or a person listening it's if it hurts your low back you're doing it wrong yeah. right but if you feel comfortable and that cue helps it, it's helped out more people than it's done harm this is where I, too i like using props like a stick to run yes. down the spine and and mainly to then also if you're drawing in your abs and you're pushing your lower back into the stick like that's a tangible feedback that you're getting like okay i'm not breaking uh the, there's not a gap now between the stick and my lower back and also too to be able to kind of be close to the wall but not completely close to where uh you know there's I tell them to have a soft knee, so it's like just barely flexed, and then I want to try and touch my butt to the to the wall. Oh, that's a great that's a great idea. I've actually never used that because yeah. again, another the, the stick, the wall, are just feedback tools. It it's makes just it, feedback. Yeah, we did a video. We did a YouTube video. I did a video. I did a YouTube video on the stick. So, uh, and I think that's one of the most. I learned that at a certification course back in like two thousand and four or five, and after that, I carried a. PVC pipe around with me everywhere as a trainer and like almost every, you know, first client or early client that I got in the first week or two, I would bring that out to teach hip hinging because I think that that is probably one of the most powerful. It's hard too, like just to keep those three points of contact. You're putting yes. the spit, the, the stick down the back of their spine and it goes all the way from their head down to their butt and you're telling them to keep their hips con uh, connected to it, their their low back and their upper yeah, back and chin head. tucked and everything, yeah, yeah to and, make it happen. Oh, and then to bend over to grab. It's really the hard. It's really hard to yeah. do. When, now, why is hip hinging important? Well, uh, when you're bending over to do certain exercises like a barbell row or you're doing a deadlift, or a good morning or stiff legged deadlift, especially, or just because it's a it's a fundamental uh, way of bending over. It's a very important uh, movement, and if you don't do it well or don't know how to do it, your risk of low back injury goes through the roof. So you can't do certain exercises, and you have a higher risk of injury. So this is an important thing uh, to learn. One of the cues that I like to tell people, because I would tell people like, okay, we're gonna have you bend over a little bit. Don't have people bend over too much because sometimes their hamstrings are so tight that they are unable to uh, to hip hinge. Right. So I'll tell them, bend over a little bit, maybe 45 degrees, maybe even a little higher. And then I'd say, stick your butt out. If that didn't work, I'd say, stick your chest out. Hmm. Sometimes people understand sticking out the chest and they can't understand sticking out the butt. So I'd say, okay, can you, can you stick your butt out? And they'll, they'll like, you know, you can tell they don't know what's going on. I say, okay, okay, stick out your chest. Really pull your shoulder back, stick your chest out. But don't stand up. Stay bent over. And then automatically they would get into that hip hinge position. Then I'd say, okay, keep your chest stuck out. Stand up and then bend back over and hold that position. And then they'd start to kind of pick yeah. up 
what that feels like. Yeah, to kind of piggyback on that, that's where I would have like people put their hands behind their lower back like a waiter's bow. Mm. And so that way they are kind of, you know, placing uh, their shoulders in that position by also like folding their hands on their lower back. And then it kind of helps them to, you know, maintain that sort of rigid back. It's just crazy how we lose, because if you don't do these movements um, on a regular basis, you'll lose the ability to really be able to do them naturally. Um, and that can cause a lot of problems. And this is true for almost any movement. You got to practice these things, and hip hinging is very important. Absolutely. Next question is from Nathaniel Watson. Thoughts on lifting heavy during a cutting phase? I love this. Mm -hmm. this. This is actually so. If your goal is to maximize, get your strength as high as possible, probably not a good idea to do it while you're cutting. But if your goal is to preserve or build muscle while you're cutting, my favorite. It's yeah. my favorite method. And the reason why I like to do the heavy lifting when I'm cutting is because the longer rest periods, the lower rep ranges, they seem to lend themselves better to being in a well, calorie deficit. And theoretically, it just makes sense that you would want to, if your goal, you're in a cut phase, which means you're in a calorie deficit, you're catabolic, that if I want to preserve the most amount of muscle, I would want to send the loudest opposing signal. And what better way than doing that than lifting heavy weight like to me that just makes the most sense if i'm trying to preserve a lot of muscle doing circuit based type training in a cut like that to the average person might think like oh that makes the most sense because that's going to burn the most calories but if you so who i'm who i'm talking to matters here if i'm communicating to somebody who's dialed nutritionally i love this like if if i can tell you if you're a client of mine and you're following, like I can tell you your macros, your calories. I want you in this for the next two weeks. I know that's a deficit. I know you're going to be perfect. You're going to be dialed nutritionally. Then I love to do a, a heavy, a heavy phase during that time. Now, if you're somebody who fucks up a lot, you're you don't really track your nutrition. Then using tools like HIT training and you know a, a more faster paced workout is advantageous for the calorie burn, and so that makes sense for a cut phase. But personally, because I when I'm serious about cutting or doing some of this, I'm I can dial my diet and I can be disciplined about it. I love to send a competing signal that set, tells my body to build muscle, knowing that I'm not feeding it enough and I'm probably not going to build a lot, but I'll probably preserve the most I could by sending that yeah, signal. Yeah, people are always asking you, you know, what, how should my diet be with the different phases of like MAPS anabolic, for example? MAPS anabolic is a really good classic uh, workout routine. It's uh, it's kind of got the philosophy all wrapped into one. There's three different phases, and the first phase is the heavy lifting phase. So people are always like, okay, should I be in a calorie surplus here or in a deficit? What what should I do? And I say, okay, well, it, it kind of yeah. depends. If you're trying to maximize your strength, if you want to lift heavy because your goal is to hit new PRs, then you don't want to cut yeah, you when wanna, you're lifting heavy. You want to eat. Yeah. But if your goal is to keep muscle while you're dieting, heavy lifting during a cut is exceptional. I love it. It's more comfortable <laughs> for me too because – you know, I know HIIT training burns a lot of calories. I know, you know, faster paced and supersets burns more calories. I get that. So I get how it makes sense. You're trying to burn as much body fat, burn more calories with your diet. But it sucks to do the fast paced workouts when your calories are low. It's really, really hard. Well, and the truth is, if you're doing a really good job of managing your calories, you're in enough of a deficit that you should be burning them. That, and that's why. That's where the deficit comes from. Right, diet. exactly. So that's who, who I'm talking to matters. If it's myself and my program, I love to do that. If it's a client who I know follows the nutrition guidelines to a T, brilliant way mm -hmm. to do it. Uh, if they're not, then I, I, ha I see value in doing more circuit based. But. Uh, somebody who's who's doing it right, I think, or the best way, in my opinion, would be somebody who is yeah. managing nutritionally. And this is how I got ready for every show. It, and that's why people couldn't understand, uh, like my peers, how I was never ever on the cardio machine until like the last two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. It's because I'm going to I'm going to uh, manage my my fat loss through my programming and my nutrition. Like I'm going to create a deficit that nutritionally I'm going to be losing body fat week over week. And then as I got into those final weeks, that's when all of a sudden I would ramp up cardio. And what's great is it's novel. I haven't been doing it for mm. eight weeks already like all of my peers were. So when I got on there and spent 45 minutes to an hour, my body dropped like a rock mm. because it was it was new. It was novel, a new stimulus. And so, and our body adapts to cardio really fast. So very similar mentality. Yeah, and in the reality is that you can lift heavy, you can lift light, you can do superset. 
you're, you're, it doesn't matter if you're in a cutting or a bulking phase of your diet. It just depends on your goal. I mean, you can lift heavy and be in a bulk. You could also do supersets and be in a bulk or do HIIT training and be in a bulk. If my goal is maximal stamina and endurance and athletic performance – Right. Hit training in a bulk is phenomenal. I actually used to do that, yeah, quite yeah. a bit because mm-hmm. you know I was my goal in the off season was to gain constantly gain, but like I had to maintain endurance and explosiveness and agility and all those things. So like I had to move and I had to move quick and uh, and explosively. So you know, yeah, it totally depends on your goal. Next question is from Tanner Sorrels. How important are the types of shoes you wear when lifting? What effect do flat soles, arch support, elevated heels, etc., have? You know, you know. If, had you asked me this question years ago, I would have been like, "Ah, eh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, just do your workout." Then I got myself a pair of squat shoes, mm. and you know, this is you know, CrossFit was getting real popular early on. I would see lifters using squat shoes. I thought it was silly. Now you're onto the uh, New Balance dad shoes. Yeah, just because you know it's cool. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, you it's want my, to be awesome. Yeah, exactly. It's my sex repellent. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I it's working. Yeah, <laughs> no, but I would see people use squat shoes. I used to think that's so dumb. Who cares? What's the big deal? Whatever. Then I put some on, and I was able to squat like 20 more pounds uh, right away. And the reason why is because the way squat shoes work is they elevate the heels. They're very stable. And they, they require less ankle mobility. So I, I, I now don't have to have as much ankle mobility to be able to squat yeah. as low uh, with as much strength or whatever. So shoes make a very, very big difference. Now, here's the thing. Ideally, you have feet that are strong, stable, that you can articulate. And ideally, you'd work out in flat shoes or shoes that have no support so that your foot is constantly stabilizing and being connected to the floor. That's the best possible way to generally work out. Now, here's the problem. 99.9% of you listening right now are not that person. Yeah. Most of your, your feet, feet aren't ready for that. No, and if you go work out with flat, you know, no support shoes or whatever, you'll actually increase your risk of injury. So if you always work out with lots of support, but you want to move towards working out with less support, do it very, very slowly and work on things like foot and ankle mobility. Um, otherwise, uh, if you don't care about all that stuff and you're like, I don't care about my foot and ankle mobility, which is too bad because I think it's a, something you should, but if you don't, I'd say put the shoes on that help you lift the most comfortably um, and then you're set. Well, you're you good. were you were actually the person that turned me on to squat shoes. Mm. I never squatted. I usually do turn people on. Yeah. See? Uh, yeah. You, I had never used uh, squat shoes in my life before. Um, until like, this was like the first, very first year that mind pump was getting started. And, uh, you know, Sal said, Hey man, you got to try these squat shoes that I just got. I think it'll, it'll really help your squat. And you, you were raving about how much it helped and it felt better to squat in them. And I thought, okay, well, let me, let me try them. And I tried them and felt the same thing too. Now, what I, what I loved about that whole situation in, in my jer- fitness journey, because this is 15 years and later in my career, I'm very aware of the importance of mm-hmm. hip mobility, ankle mobility, all that stuff. I'm not naive to any of that. I have all my certifications that help me teach all that shit. Yet, ironically, I did not realize how, what a limiting factor it was in my squat and until those shoes, until I felt – Wow, my squat feels so much better. And all they are doing is they are they are crutching my lack of ankle mobility. And now because I have something that is assisting that, all of a sudden my squat felt so much better. So what it really did for me was, and that was right before I went in my hardcore mobility kick, is it really opened my eyes of how much uh, I lacked that. And never in my career had I really dedicated like, okay, I'm going to improve my ankle mobility. I'm really going to get after this and see if I can make a difference there. And I tell you, uh, it, it is the single best thing that I have done for my squat is to improve my, and I think that's exaggerated for someone like me because I'm six foot three and I have long limbs. So I think somebody who has really long limbs and is tall, this is, is, is exceptionally or exceptionally important for them because you, in order for a big six foot three tall person to get into a really deep squat, you have to have good ankle mobility. Unless you have these odd, weird, short legs and and limbs on your lower body, but not mm-hmm. your upper body, and that's how you're six three. That would be a really weird looking person. Yeah. Most people that are above six foot tall are going to have relatively long limbs, 
And that, in order to get yourself all the way down into a deep squat, it just requires so much more ankle mobility. And I mean, I've, I remember when I first started, I, I did the combat stretch, which is where you, the video I did on YouTube, where you push your knee over, and I could get maybe comfortably a quarter of an inch, you know, beyond my toes. I, and because as a trainer, we were taught to teach people, yeah, never go past, your toes. never go past your toes yeah. for for safety reasons, right? All the certifications taught. You know, your knees should be right above your toes. Yeah. Too much stress on ligaments. Right. And we didn't want to stress the patella, and this was dangerous to do that. So I coached that way forever. I most certainly trained that way forever. Yet when you look at, like, some of the best squatters in the world, your Olympic lifters and stuff like that, you look at their knees, and their knees are like a half a oh, foot yeah. beyond their toes. Mm -hmm. And so I began to pursue this, can I get my knees – you know, several inches beyond my toes. And that is, that's where the squat and scroll came from. That's where this ability for me to go ass to grass, but it was the, all the work and effort that was put into that. The shoes was what helped me though, to see that and then to work towards that. Yeah. It was interesting. I used to always wear like running shoes or like Nike shoes or like supported shoes, like forever working out because I thought that you, we had to have that. You know, we had to have that support constantly. And I was in this gym and this is like when the the whole like five finger shoes started to kind of take off the minimus kind of stuff. And uh, there was lots of trainers actually in there with their clients in chucks. And I was like making fun of them. I'm just like, what are you doing? Like they're in chucks. We're working out here. Like what's happening? And then I, I started to realize too, I I gave it a try and was just kind of like gradually like trying to, to, to get like more of a minimus type shoe and uh, immediately found like the, the functionality there too as well, doing lunges or things like that where I could, uh, you know, get on my forefoot a lot easier. I had that flexibility there in my shoe to where it allowed, uh, you know, more of the natural sort of uh, ways of stabilizing with my feet to, to occur. And so I started to kind of bring that in with my clients and start to play with that. But it was very much like not, not, I didn't want to jump from these moon shoes down to like nothing you know, supporting that because there was issues of that where people would get really aggressive with now I could just do everything like barefoot almost, but I haven't built up oh. that support system. Oh, that, that, when that whole movement happened, a lot of people got hurt. There was a movement there for a second in the running. There world. was a lawsuit too. Right? Yeah. Where, where the, there were runners who were talking, there was a book, I don't remember what it was. There was a book that came out. It talked about born uh, to run. I that's, think. is that it right yeah. there? Uh -huh. And I guess the I don't read the book, um, but I, I I believe the author went around the world and watched uh, people run around the world mm -hmm. uh, from cultures where and tribes, for example, where they've been r running since they were children. And he noticed he would photograph them running, and he noticed with that when people run barefoot, especially people who've been running barefoot for a long time, that they hit the ground differently yes. than when you run with big running shoes. And he said, "Oh, we're running." Totally wrong. And everything in the, that he says that, that I know that he said so far, again, I didn't read the book, is totally true. It's 100% correct. The problem is if you grew up in a modern Western society, you've probably worn shoes since the second you could walk. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you look at little kids' shoes, they're really stiff on the bottom and they say, oh, this is good to, to support your kids' feet or whatever. And as an adult, you walk in heels or tennis shoes or whatever. And it, just look at your foot. Take your foot out. Took, take your sock off. Look down at your foot. Then Google a picture of a hunter-gatherer's foot. Besides the calluses and all that stuff, look at their toes. Yeah. Look, look at how them. they can articulate them just like fingers. Yeah, their toes are spread out. Their, their feet are muscular. You look at our toes. Our toes are all crunched together. If you have really big feet, your toes are really fucked up. Look at the pictures of NBA players' feet. Yeah, like LeBron James. Scary. Yeah. And it, because their feet were so big, I'm sure they wore shoes that didn't, didn't fit them. And so our feet and everything kind of formed to the the shoes that we wore, the fact that we have all the support. And so if you go from where you're at now to going barefoot, you're going to uh, totally hurt yourself. You're going to cause uh, yourself problems. So it's yeah. a very slow process. And look, sh inserts, shoe inserts, and you know, art support and stuff like that can be huge helps for a lot of people. There, you know, some people have back problems and, and uh, ankle issues and knee issues, and they wear inserts. And their feet, uh, their 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 joints feel a lot better, and that's because they're it's like a crutch. It's it's causing better movement. But you can train your feet and your ankles 
to get stronger so that you don't need yeah. some of the stuff. But so it's they a respond long properly again. Yes. It's a very yeah. long process though. I used to actually take my clients, uh, and it was a new thing that I'd introduced, of just walking with their barefoot before we even get started training and just to see, you know, how they were like loading their foot and like what kind of patterns that, that you know, they were falling upon, like walking down and back. And you could see all that as a trainer very visibly. Oh, it's crazy because the, the bottom of your foot is got, you know, tons and tons of nerve endings. You can articulate, we're supposed to be able to articulate our toes quite well, obviously not like our hands. But if you guys close, but have you guys ever seen videos of people with have no, no arms? hands? Yeah, and they and can they, write with their feet. Oh, they can they, type. They, with they their eat feet. cereal. Yes. Yeah, yeah. With, with spoons and stuff. Yeah, so that the the capability is there, and think of all the br the brain networks that are connected to that that are totally atrophied because we wear these casts essentially mm -hmm. on our feet, you know, twenty four seven. And so what ends up happening? You grow up this way. You're an adult. You're like, I want to reverse this. I want to have, you know. You're going to make yeah. progress, but you'll never, yeah. unfortunately, be able to get that same ability that you you had that potential because, you know, you grew up most of your life wearing but shoes. I, so be very careful. I definitely, I mean, I highly recommend. Uh, and when I say training, I mean like weight training, not running, because I think running is what's more risky barefoot than way more skill. You know, yeah, yeah. Weight, weight training. I think, I think getting a client, uh, or myself, once a, once a week for sure when I'm training, even when my my frequency is low. I will get for sure a workout in barefoot. Mm -hmm. uh, I love to do walking lunges barefoot. I love to do tippy toe squats barefoot. Squat, deadlift barefoot. Yeah, I, I love, love to do my mobility drills barefoot. So I'll start off before I even get into my weight training. I kick the shoes off, do all my 90-90 mm -hmm. combat drills and you know lizard with rotation. And I'm doing that all barefoot. Um, I, I definitely think that and there was a, I mean, what, two, three years ago on the show, I was sharing a lot on, on my Instagram of, barefoot walking i would try and take a 10 minute walk every now what day. if you go to a gym and they say you can't go barefoot so then guys, the, how do you guys feel about the five finger shoes i mean there's, yeah, there's I mean, value in it for that i yeah. think uh i think it's going to kill your your uh, sex life but i mean <laughs> if if you're if you're that's your only way to do it i mean here's the thing i, Inter I intertwine your i would take that that same person who goes to that gym okay because <laughs> i i at the time that i was doing this i had the same gym so i was going to a gym that I couldn't take my shoes off with that. So every day I took a 10 minute walk barefoot mm -hmm, with yeah. my dog. So I would personally, that's me. I'm, I'm not a big five finger shoe guy. I just, I think they are like <laughs> ridiculous and ugly. Um, and that's not a reason not to do them. If you really care about building your foot strength and you want to work towards it, I think there's value in walking around in those. Better but you know, the thing is just putting those on isn't going to help a lot of people because right. they still have their bad movement patterns. Sure. They still have their muscle imbalances. So all that's going to happen is they're going to hurt themselves. Like my, I'll give you an example. My aunt um, was having some issues and uh, her, I recommended that she start walking around at home barefoot because she's always in heels That's for work. the first way to do it, yeah. Well, the problem was she overdid it uh -huh. and had caused plantar fasciitis and it's because her foot was so used to being in heels. Yeah, yeah. You got to do it very, very slowly. And the best thing you can do is this. Look, if you, if you really want to work on ankle and foot strength and mobility, which uh, I'm not lying, will make a tremendous impact on all of your standing lifts, um, and just how you feel. It makes that big of a difference. It's a, it's a part of your body that's not developed. So imagine if it becomes developed, it'll impact everything, right? Uh, Maps Prime Pro. Maps Prime Pro has an ankle and foot section, um, and you need to do those exercises two, two to three times a day, five to 10 minutes at a time, every single day, um, and, and do those specific exercises before you decide to go just, just put on five-finger toe shoes or go walk around barefoot. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download all of our guides, resources, and books. They're all free. You can also find the three of us on Instagram. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin and Adam at Mind Pump Adam.